Hello friends. For today's video, I wanted to go through my all-time favorite adult fantasy standalones. I had the hardest time narrowing down what my favorites were, so I just decided I wasn't going to. <laughs> I have 12 different books to mention today. I do have a top five, top six, but I didn't want to just talk about them. I wanted to talk about some of the other ones on this list as well. I, at the end of the video, will reveal what my top five, top six are, but I still wanted to highlight some of the others as I definitely think they deserve some recognition. So I'm going to start with one. Actually, the first two I'm going to start with are ones that are quite commonly talked about here on BookTube. They're definitely not mainstream popular, but I'm sure a lot of you have heard of them and are not going to be surprised that they're on the list. We'll start with Best Serve Cold by Joe Abercrombie. I am currently reading, at the time of filming this, the Age of Madness trilogy, and I think it's going to beat out Best Serve Cold for my favorite Abercrombie work. That said, even though I enjoyed his First Law trilogy, the second one in particular, I loved that second book. When I read Best Serve Cold, I was like, oh, okay, he can write a plot. <laughs> and it's not that I didn't think he could, but he is so often dismantling the common fantasy tropes and character archetypes that he somewhat meanders in his stories as a result of so much classic fantasy being so quest oriented and having these specific characters that you're accustomed to, your heroes, the good character, and then the evil Dark Lord. And as a result, his first law trilogy doesn't have a whole lot of, it feels like purpose. It doesn't really feel like it's all that satisfying by the end, but in a good way, but also you still feel like, oh, I guess that's it. And in Best Served Cold, I was very, very pleasantly surprised that we got a revenge story, which is not the thing I'm focusing on as liking, but the fact that a revenge story is not the most unique thing. It's not the most unique setup. However, in typical Abercrombie fashion, he did the common trope exceptionally. He, I think, represented why we like the revenge story, why we like to root for the characters when they've been wronged, but also has the age old question of is the journey really worth it when it's destroying your life? Is the revenge really worth it? And our main character is basically like, probably not, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I was like, oh, I'm not accustomed to the character being so, or the narrative being so blunt with that. And I really, really liked it. But also, you have a really focused plot and you have Abercrombie's signature fantastic character work. These characters feel so alive. There's some twists you could say kind of in the story as far as some reveals where you're like, wait, is that true? That makes me think very differently about this whole situation. <laughs> maybe kind of, maybe not entirely. I still get why she wants revenge, but also, hmm. And I just think that Abercrombie is a master at that, of kind of sprinkling in things that make you change your mind, but then there's just so many emotions. It's a roller coaster when you're reading an Abercrombie work. So Best Serve Cold, really, really loved that one. And I thought it deserved to be on my list of favorites. Next up, as I said, continuing with the booktube darlings, we have Sword of Kaigen. I definitely was really on the fence when I first started this one because I had heard nothing pretty much but amazing things. And when I first started it, I wasn't really feeling the writing. I felt like the setting wasn't what I was expecting. And I thought that the setup for everything, it's not that it felt clunky, but I was kind of thinking, what are we doing here? And as a result, when we get to the really heavy parts of the story, it was such a gut punch and so unexpected. There are some scenes in this that are so distinct still. And I think that says something. A lot of us, we love to read. We read a, a ton of fantasy books in general. And sometimes we have a general feeling associated with a book and we can kind of describe vaguely things about it, but we don't remember specifics. And there are scenes that I could I can describe to you how I felt when I read them, what was going on in that scene. It just has some of the most impressive, emotionally impactful moments in any book I've ever read. And that includes books and series, ends of series, and of course, standalones. So while I don't think it's a perfect book because the beginning is a little bit awkward, it kind of stumbles its way into its story, the highs of this are truly some of the best in any anything I've ever read and just so unexpected with what the author does with it. And if you don't know the setup, you're following what is basically our own world and it feels like modern times, but the specific island is somewhat focused on the past. It seems rooted in the past, I, I should say. And you have a lot of propaganda that is being fed 
to make sure that the population stays in line and you're looking at the prices that have to be paid when you break out of that. And those are some pretty heavy prices. <laughs> the next one I'm going to mention, it's the only one that is technically considered young adult. And when I say that, I mean it's sold in young adult. I would actually argue, though, that this would be better suited for just honestly, probably the general fiction section, even though it is fantasy, as I think that the themes and the way it's written are more appealing to adults. And that would be The Kingdom of Back. I said I was going to start the video with some booktube darlings, and I purposely wanted this third book that I mentioned to be very different in that this is, I think, severely underhyped. I think it's somewhat underrated as well, and I think that this book is exceptional and that so many people would really resonate with it. I actually want to say, too, if you like the themes in Addie LaRue, I think that there's a good chance that you would like this book as well, as so much of this is focused on being remembered and often being remembered through your art. Art plays a huge role in the invisible life of Addie LaRue also. The Kingdom of Back is historical fiction fantasy and it kind of utilizes this almost Narnia-esque uh, setting, but it gets very, very dark as our main character is growing older. And the reason being, our main character is Nanuro Mozart, who is Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's sister. She was a real figure in history. She was just as talented, if not more talented, than her brother. And most people in the world have no idea that Mozart, when they hear Mozart, they just think the one. They didn't even realize that there was a sister. And they certainly don't associate her with music because they don't even know she exists. And the reason is that in that time, it was considered improper for women to perform. Oddly, it was not considered improper for little girls to perform, which is odd. But as you were growing into a woman, it was seen as something that wasn't okay. It's not okay for a woman to flaunt her talents. <laughs> so the reason that the magical world that the characters sort of go to, and you can't really tell, it's almost magical realism as to whether or not it actually exists in this book or if it's just a figment of her imagination. But as she's growing older and there is a lot of restrictions on her and she's starting to realize that, which is oh, just so, it's so sad to watch a child <laughs> realize that basically to lose her innocence because she realizes that the world is never going to accept her or treat her well and that's so obvious based off of how they treat her brother. Anyway, it's just devastating to watch and I should say to read and especially knowing she was a real person in history where you're like, oh, she should have been valued stupid people and their views back in the day. Anyway, so she in the magical world, because of what's going on in her life, the magic and the whimsy that she used to escape to. She's losing that too. And it becomes darker and darker. And there's so many things you could dissect about this book. It is done exceptionally. I will say I majored in music. I thought I was going to hate this book. I thought I'm like, oh, geez, I'm going to get these like descriptions that are ultimately kind of dumb and that aren't actually what it's like when you're playing music or how musicians think about music. Because it's always written in a way that just feel I'm like, no, it's so floaty and abstract. And that's not necessarily what it's like when you play music and Anyway, no, Marie Lu did a fantastic job. So I wouldn't even say I have complaints or criticisms. I would say I was impressed by how she wrote the music. And I think it turned out that she plays piano. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, I mean, that makes sense. But even if she didn't, uh, the writing is fantastic. And I thought the book was fantastic. The themes were executed beautifully, but tragically. And it's a fantastic book. And also, I think it's great because it also lets people know that there's a figure in history they might not have known about. Next up, also depressing, we have The Crane Husband. This is a, I think, considered a novella by a fair amount of people because it's quite short. Uh, this is a story that is barely fantasy, but it follows a young girl who her mother one day brings home a giant crane, and this giant crane is basically her lover. And he has such an impact on the dynamic of the house. And the whole thing is essentially a metaphor for domestic abuse, what it's like if you are a young person living in a home where that is your reality. As somebody who experienced something very similar, I found this story to be pretty much a perfect representation of even if the physical abuse isn't happening to you, if it's happening to a person in your home, or if you feel threatened, even though they're not laying any hands on you, the fact that they're harming a loved one of yours, it just, it's stifling. And it plays a huge impact on your life, your ability to think, how you're supposed to navigate school and have a normal childhood when this, it just, it captures all of that 
perfectly. And I think there's the added element in this of the main character being the older sister of the two children. And she wants to be there for her little brother, but she's a child herself. So it's very difficult for her to manage her own life, let alone her brother's. It's very abstract though, I will say. And both it and the kingdom of back were ones that I was like, I mean, I'm not really into magical realism. I don't like when it's barely fantasy or the fantasy is very heady and you're like, oh, is this even happening? I'm not usually a fan of that, but I think both of those just did it masterfully. I thought they were absolutely fantastic. I would highly recommend. They're pretty heavy, as you can probably guess. Next up, I love this next one so much. I'm just thinking about the main character. I'm like, oh, they're so sweet. They're such a cinnamon roll. <laughs> I'll just say that already. If you need a cinnamon roll character, check out the Goblin Emperor. Maya is precious. Oh my gosh, is he precious. This, however, is so dense. <laughs> not necessarily... It's not like malaz and dense. It's not like, oh my gosh, there's just this enormous world and there's centuries and thousands of years that are going by and I'm glimpsing this moment and I have to keep track of it. It's not dense in that way. It's dense in the sense that there are so many characters and so many really intense fantasy names. The spelling in this is a lot. <laughs> and I can't, I feel so bad for the narrator of the audiobook because I was like, oh my gosh, this must have been almost like learning a new language <laughs> because the names in this, I'm like, I don't know how they did it, but they were fantastic. So if you're a fan of audiobooks, maybe check out the audiobook for this one. But anyway, all of it serves a purpose. I will say it's not convoluted just to be convoluted. The main setup for the story is that you follow this young man who his father has passed away. His father was the emperor. He was sort of a cast out son because he is half goblin. The only reason that his father even had a goblin wife was to secure an alliance. He solidified the marriage, you could say, but that one night did produce a child and that would be Maya. However, the emperor wanted nothing to do with his wife or child, but respect for them uh, dictated that he at least provide them with a decent home and servants and a staff and those sorts of things. So Maya, however, lost his mother at a really young age and he essentially has been all alone for most of his life, even though there are staff and he has some level of privilege. He is so incredibly isolated and alone and the person who is his paternal figure after that is not very kind, they're cruel to him. And poor Maya is just, he's got this pure heart, but after his father dies and pretty much everybody else, not pretty much, it is true, everybody else in line for the throne after him has died in the same accident, now Maya is suddenly on the throne. He is suddenly the emperor, hence the title, the Goblin Emperor. And he, one, is mistreated and thought of differently because of the fact that he is half goblin. And also, there are so many people with ulterior motives. There are so many people hoping, oh, he's going to be clueless. He won't know what he's doing. He's just going to be this puppet that we can control for our own financial gains, so that we can get more power. And there are a lot of people also that just genuinely hate him, that want him to die and want him removed because they want their own person on the throne. So he has so much placed on him immediately and how he chooses to navigate it, the ways in which he chooses what would ultimately be the moral decision. He always follows his, you could say his code, his moral code. It's just so admirable. He's a lovely protagonist. And in a sea of fantasy books now that are either grimdark or you have morally gray characters or anti-heroes, it's just kind of nice to return to a character that is He's facing a lot of obstacles. It's not like he gets whatever he wants just because he's good, but that goodness, it's a sacrifice to continue to be good because it would be easier sometimes to give in, but it makes him all the more admirable. It makes you root for him all the more. It's just, he's so lovely. <laughs> he's just precious. Next up, I'm surprised this one's on the list, but it did, similar to what I was talking about with Sword of Kai, and it had some moments that just really struck me, and that would be The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. So I mentioned this a little bit ago. I read this recently, and you know, it really did hit. <laughs> and if you don't know, which I'm sure you do, the setup for this story is you follow a young woman who was basically cursed by this devil-like being, and she is cursed to live forever. She doesn't really age. She heals. However, she 
is always forgotten. Everyone she meets, once they leave the room, once they go their separate ways from her, they'll forget her. So she can't also leave her her story. She can't write her name down. She can't leave her mark on the world. And so it's kind of asking the question, what is a life if you leave no footprint, you could say. And the way in which that she perseveres through it, the way she learns to cope, her cleverness as she is navigating the world, as someone who people now see as a threat when they do see her and she seems to appear out of nowhere. There's just so much that's dissected. And you follow her hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and then you're seeing back and forth between present day and the past. And I'm sure the thing you've probably heard is that she's destined to be forgotten. However, one day someone remembers her. And that's kind of the big like, oh my gosh, what moment? And even though, and and this is why I decided this deserved to be on the the list. There's a lot of great moments. I love the writing. I like B.E. Schwab's writing in general. But the thing that I was like, wow, okay, I was not expecting that was even though I knew from the synopsis that there was going to be somebody who finally remembered her, when that moment happened, man, I'm getting emotional thinking about it. When that moment happened, I almost started crying because you see how much she has struggled for so long, the sense of loneliness, this desperation for human contact, for a genuine connection to somebody, to something. And when she finally has that moment, oh, it was very, very hard hitting, really impactful. There's a number of other moments in that book that I I don't want to say because it would be spoilery, but man, the, like I said with Sword of Kaigen, the highs, I was like, oh, great. Interestingly enough, I, I found the ending kind of underwhelming. It's not that I didn't like it, but I also, I mean, I should say it's not that I hated it, but I also didn't love it. So the ending kind of just happened. But then there's a part of me, I'm like, was that sort of intentional? Was that sort of like a, and then life just goes on sort of meta thing. But then there's another part of me that's like, I don't think so. (laughs) I think I just didn't love the ending and I'm maybe giving it too much credit. Anyway, moving on. The next two I'm going to group together because they're both uh, mythology retellings or, or retellings of stories, characters within stories that you don't typically get to focus on. And that would be KKE and The Witch's Heart. So one of them is Indian inspired, one of them is Norse inspired, and I really enjoyed both of these. I will say, um, Genevieve Gornacek has written another book that I really, really liked, but I decided Witch's Heart beat it out just a little bit, and it is following Loki's wife, Angra Boda, the mother of monsters. And I just thought that the way in which the mother figure was written in the story was fantastic. The fact that she will do anything for her children and her love for her children, we just don't get to see that in fantasy very often. And it plays such a pivotal role in this. And I thought it was exceptional. I don't want to say too much else because I don't want to ruin the story. But the last thing I'll say about this, one of the only things since I didn't talk about it that much, is that there's a moment at the end where it sort of shifts your perspective of the motives of someone else, I'll say. And then you just kind of are like, oh, every parent just wants to do what they can for their children. It just is such a hard hitting moment, I thought. And I was really impressed that the author managed to do that because for so long you're like, this other person though, nah. (laughs) Um, And then with KKE, This is a story following a woman from the time that she's very young as she grows into an adult and the lack of agency that is uh, a big part of her life, but how she chooses to take advantage of what privilege she does have, the power she does have, the relationships in her life, and how she's always trying to do what she can to help others, to better her society. There's a lot of really fantastic questions that arise in this because our character does feel very strongly toward tradition and faith and those sorts of things. But at the same time, she recognizes that sometimes those things kind of go head to head with progress. And she sees how certain groups of people are oppressed or how they're looked at in a more negative way. And she wants to do everything in her power to respect that that came before, that influenced her life, that she does hold value in, but also wants to do what she can to better the lives of everyone, regardless of her culture or the things that other people have dictated as this is how things must be. And I think that 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 specific 
conundrum, you could say, in her life is something I think a lot of people experience. And so I thought that the author navigated that exceptionally. And the time I'm filming this, it's not out yet, but she has another book coming out. And I'm like, oh, yes. <laughs> I'm so excited because KKE I thought was absolutely fantastic. Next up, I personally would consider this book YA. It's kind of the opposite of Kingdom of Back. I would consider it young adult, but it's, I believe, technically sold as adult, and that would be Yumi and the Nightmare Painter. This one is just sweet. The science fiction fantasy, I guess you could say subgenre, I thought was amazing. It was so cool to see a setting so drastically different than what I'm accustomed to. And I have said this so many times, and so I know I'm kind of a broken record, but there was a lot of inspiration from the video game Final Fantasy X, which is still to this day one of my all-time favorite stories ever across any medium. It was so good. It's still so good. I still think about it all the time. I get emo- as soon as I hear the Xanarkin theme, I get emotional. <laughs> anyway, so to find a book, because I've always wanted that. I've always wanted a book that just felt a little bit like Final Fantasy X. So I definitely have a soft spot and a bias for this one for that. I don't know if it impacted me quite the same way a lot of these other ones did. However, I, I just, you know, I know it's bias. I know it's nostalgia playing a role. But, and, and I will say, it's not like this book is horrible otherwise or anything like that. It's still really great and I still really loved it. Um, it follows these two characters that are kind of thrust into each other's lives and they're trying to navigate that. There's a lot of banter, but then they push each other and they learn to come into their own and it's really, really lovely and it's all within this awesome science fiction fantasy, like I said, subgenre. But anyway, um, I know I have some bias for it, but I'm like, but that doesn't change that I love it, you know? So I just felt like it was important that I they still mention it because sometimes that's the case. Sometimes you just have something where you're like, you know what? I just love these things about this book and I can't, I just, I can't help it. I love it. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's the case with literally any book, right? We all come to books with our own experiences and different things that we connect to and things like that. It's just this one has a very obvious at the forefront reason why. So... Anyway, I still love it. Anyway, moving on. Uh, the Magician's Daughter. This book is a coming of age story done basically perfectly. I think coming of age can be very difficult to navigate, but when done well, it's so good. And now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, can this be adapted by Studio Ghibli? Because, oh my gosh, they handle those kinds of themes perfectly, exceptionally, masterfully, and I think that this would be so good. Uh, so you follow this young girl who is living on this island with her father figure. He basically adopted her after she just sort of arrived on her island, so her arrival is a mystery. But he has taken care of her, and this island is protected by these magical wards that her father figure has put up. And it actually technically takes place in our own world, so it's historical fantasy. And one day the wards are starting to fail and her father figure realizes I have to go back and confront my past. And she essentially tags along with his familiar and his familiar is so cute. But as she traverses to our own world, uh, because this other one was magically protected. So once she arrives, she is finding there's a lot of hardships in life that she is unaccustomed to. She's starting to see what other people's lives are like. And almost like her sense and grip on reality is almost questioned because she has been so removed from this for so long. And she's always wanted to go explore the real world, you could say. And then when she's starting to see it for what it is, it really makes her question a lot of things. And I thought that was done really well. I also think the questioning of her parental figure is something that I think at some point a lot of children, they grow to respect their parents, but they also start to realize their parents are people too. And I think how that was done in this was fantastic. Plus there is kind of a mystery of the past and what even was going on and why are there people that want to come after them and why is there a need to put magical wards up? And so all of that's explored really, really well. Next up, Nettle and Bone. I love this one so much. I was about to say, oh, another favorite, but that's what this whole video is. Nettle and Bone just really took me by surprise. It's my first T. Kingfisher. It remains my favorite T. Kingfisher. This and A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking, but that one is not adult fantasy. So uh, sadly, we're not chatting about that one today. But Nettle and Bone, I just was not expecting. I didn't know what I was expecting when I got into this one. I just figured, okay, I'll give this one a try. One of you recommended this author to me. And thank you so much for that because I have fallen in love with this author's writing. 
and we're very spoiled because she puts out books very quickly. Um, but anyway, so our main character, Mara, discovers that her sister, who was married off to a prince for a marriage alliance to secure security for their country through his military, she finds out that the, the man is abusing her sister. And she realizes, I can't just go kill him because then we would lose our ally and our protection. But I also, I can't, you know, just take my sister because that's not going to work. So what do I do? I can't just continue to let her be harmed. So she kind of goes on this quest to try and find an answer for herself. And it's kind of a ragtag group of characters that come together to try and accomplish this, this feat of doing what they can to free her sister from this horrible situation. And despite the very dark subject matter of the catalyst for the plot, uh, it's actually a very funny book and it's just cheeky. It's it's not funny and where it almost takes a second sometimes to realize that there's a joke in there or sometimes just the way the character in the narrative, a, a situation will be described. You're like, that's hilarious. And uh, for example, our main character, Mara, um, thinks that she, I'm trying to remember, oh man, I don't want to get this wrong, but it's something like she realizes she wants to come back and haunt a man who, you know, wronged her. She's kind of like a scorned lover and she thinks she wants to come back and haunt him, but she just decides she wouldn't make a very good ghost just because she doesn't have like the look of one. And I'm, I'm doing a terrible job <laughs> describing what made that funny, but the way it was written in the narrative, I'm like, I, I just was like, wait, what? And it was great. I just think T. King Fisher is hilarious. And I'm so grateful, like I said, to the person who recommended it. And that goes to this last book as well. I had read a book by this author that I didn't like, and then everybody's like, hey, this other standalone, still give it a try. Please still give it a try. You will probably like it. And I'm so glad I listened to you. And that would be Spinning Silver. This t is just remains. This has been one of my favorite sta fantasy standalones, and it was not kicked off the list over the years because it still, to me, is kind of like the blueprint of how to write a really satisfying, really fantastic fantasy standalone. And it is historical fiction fantasy and you follow this young woman who is looked her and her family are looked down upon in society there's a lot of stereotypes about them and it makes it very difficult for her father to do his job as he is a money lender people do not want to pay him back and because of some of the stereotypes about his group of people he realizes that if he presses for the money that he is owed they might fall back on stereotypes and it might put him and his family in danger however they're in danger anyway because they're not making any money and so the the mother of our main character miriam is starting to become very ill they're hungry they're starving so miriam decides i'm going to do everything in my power to provide for my family. And so she starts to collect on the money that is owed, how she navigates this, her demeanor, her attitude. It's just, you're like, yeah, get your money, protect your family. And in doing this though, she attracts the attention of some magical beings that are essentially fae and the very, very atmospheric, rooted in the environment and in nature type of fae that are in a lot of folklore. So she attracts the attention of them because in their eyes, she is turning silver into gold because of the concept of interest. And so they're very taken with her, but she's like, I don't want them to be taken with me. I don't want them to have, I don't, I don't want their attention. Um, but she's got it, whether she likes it or not. And she often has to kind of butt heads with this particular fae. And the way it's written is just fantastic because it really feels like almost like aliens. They have their own culture and their own customs and their own way of looking at things, but then they're also so incredibly powerful. But Miriam is not the only character in the story. There's a lot of different characters. And one of my criticisms you could say of this story is that it does not tell you whose perspective you're reading from, from chapter to chapter. And that was unnecessary. I think they could have just put the character's name to remedy the confusion at the start of chapters. However, the characters are so distinct and so well written that you figure it out pretty quickly. I still think that little extra step would have helped, but that does... I have to give the applause to the author for writing her characters so distinctly that you were able to tell who was who. And the other characters have really interesting stories. They kind of catch attention, the attention of uh, powerful beings as well. So you're sort of seeing how all that comes together, how all these characters are connected. And I've said before, this story shows the 
quiet ways in which people can be powerful. It's not always these big epic quests. It's not always people that wield incredible magic. Sometimes it's just something as simple as looking out for your family, looking out for yourself, looking out for your sibling, and standing up for what's right. And I think that that book does it exceptionally. That's it though for my top 12 favorite adult fantasy standalones with a little exception of The Kingdom of Back technically is considered young adult, but I think it should be considered adult. And then You, Me, and the Nightmare Painter is considered adult, even though I think it should technically be considered young adult. Um, I will say I did not have any fantasy romance books on this list. If I did, I would probably have The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches and Half a Soul because I think that those are absolutely precious and delightful. And then at the very beginning of the video, I said I would mention what my top five, top six favorites are. And those would be Spinning Silver, Nettle and Bone, Sword of Kaigen, The Goblin Emperor, and The Kingdom of Back. So those would be my top five. But currently, at the time I'm, you know, filming this today, this could change from day to day. But I think if I had to pick a sixth, it might be it might be The Magician's Daughter. I feel like the more I think about that book, the more I really loved it. I want to reread it. I really enjoyed, I, I just really enjoyed that story, but I don't know. I feel like on a different day, I'd be like, okay, guy, it's so great, or, you know, it would change. So I, I just have the hardest time narrowing down my favorites, but at least the top five, I can say pretty confidently, I really love those five. I love all of these. So there you go. <laughs> um, but anyway, let me know what is your all-time favorite fantasy standalone. Thanks so much for watching though. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll see you later. Bye.